So good afternoon. Let's get going. You know, Sasha was just telling me that when he does these classes now that they're back, are back in person, unless the first row fills up, he doesn't start talking. Uh, he made a concession that he said, OK, at least if the second and third row fill up, then he'll start talking. So I'm going to request some of you to move forward. It really helps uh, a speaker to make eye contact. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I know exactly what you feel and mean. OK. so. Uh, Do I, do I do the reading for the, ah, okay, okay. So before I start, uh, just to, uh, yeah. The Harvard Graduate School of Design is located in the traditional and ancestral lands of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. Uh, we pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationship that led to the creation of this acknowledgment. And with that, I welcome Sasha Dells. Uh, thank you very much for doing this and sharing with us some of your work. Uh, Sasha is an architect, a researcher. He's working really at the intersection of urban design and urban studies with his background in architecture. Uh, he's worked with Dillus Cofido uh, for two years, he was telling me, in New York, uh, and uh, has been an instructor and researcher at the ETH in the Department of Architecture, so very much rooted in interest in architecture, which he's now expanded into questions of housing and other urban sort of related scale issues. Uh, he also was with the Future Cities Lab in Singapore. And while he was doing his PhD, he was investigating urban and rural transformations under the premise of international development cooperation in Ethiopia. And he continues to explore the sort of cooperative housing for low income context, which comes out of that interest. And, you know, uh, Mark Angeli, Sasha was here. He was teaching for two semesters and focused on Ethi Ethiopia on similar issues of housing, but also its intersection with livelihoods uh, in an urban context. And so there has been some discussion and conversation here on Ethiopia, just for your reference. Sasha's current research focuses on how specific political economic frameworks influence the manifestation of architecture, urban form, and living environments, addressing challenges of uneven development, asymmetric cooperate cooperation setups and exclusive distribution of urban resources. He aims at advancing knowledge and more equitable and collaborative practices of urban production in general and on nonprofit models of adequate and affordable housing in particular. And you know, very much like I think we try at the GSD to really situate housing at the intersection of urbanization and not see them as two separate sort of aspects, and which is very much, I think, why we are so interested in your work, because you're doing that in pretty rigorous ways. He is now an assistant professor at the University of Southern California, and he focuses on collective and cooperative models of urban housing, infrastructure, and services that can potentially create more inclusive and sustainable urban environments. He holds a master's degree in architecture, as I said, from the ETH, uh, and uh, he is the co-editor and co-author of a 2020 publication, which if you don't mind, I might hold up, uh, which he has a few copies of, uh, which uh, is uh, Housing the Co-op, a Micro-Political Manifesto, which has been published by Ruby Press. You know, we also have uh, about 50 people watching this online, so I, I extend a welcome to all of you who are online. And I know many folks at the Joint Center are watching this. Uh, and, uh, you know, just again to contextualize for Sasha and for some of you here, uh, Jennifer, who is here from the architecture department, is also part of this process. And I, there might be other students who I haven't spotted. But, you know, the Joint Center has been working very hard under the leadership of uh, Chris Herbert to make connections and intersections with the GSD. Their focus has been policy and finance and models of facilitating and supporting housing, but are also now reaching out to create these intersections with design, which is, again, very much, I think, where you're situated, Sasha. And, uh, you know, they do a famous report, uh, which is called the State of Housing in, in America uh, report. Uh, and now they're going to complement that with a report on the state of housing design. Uh, and the first issue, hopefully, will be out in the spring. Uh, so 
again, this interconnection, not only between urbanization, but housing, but also bringing the dimension and the value that spatial imaginations can add to our own addressing the question of housing, which is adequate and affordable. So with that, Sasha, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you again for coming. Can anybody hear me? All right. Thank you, Raul, very much for this kind introduction, also for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I was been, I've was i been here 15 years ago as a student, so it was kind of nice and funny to walk around the building a little bit before I came down to this uh, Stubbins um, room here. And also thank you for everyone who was in the back office behind the curtain helping me coming here. Um, I highly appreciate it. So far, everything went very smoothly. So, um, like Raul said, I'm going to talk about uh, my current kind of interest and occupation with um, housing cooperatives, uh, non profit housing, but housing cooperatives in particular. This has mainly to do maybe with um, my origin as a Swiss person from Switzerland. There's a strong cooperative sector in Switzerland, uh, different European countries. So for us, that's always something that we kind of take granted. And um, it's kind of normal part of our daily lives. Uh, but uh, the research I've done after my PhD, um, which resulted basically in this little book, kind of shows or tries to show that this is something that is everywhere, all around the globe. It just depends on you know what kind of um, frameworks there are, whether cooperatives can thrive or not. And as an architect, it was particularly interesting to look at it from the housing perspective, um, because it directly, in case of the Swiss cooperatives, it, it directly coincides with kind of um, interesting things that happen in architecture because of this model as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is just very. Uh, um, Maybe it says I'm, I'm going to do a little bit um, um, a rhetorical uh, uh, talk. Um, I'm going to talk about how cooperatives could respond to what I identify as myths in the housing production world. And myths might be kind of a strong uh, word, but it's it's uh, more or less like think about beyond the status quo, beyond what we kind of generally know or think about if we're confronted with this. And uh, in the world of architecture, but also housing development, there's a lot of kind of stonewalled, um, very linear thinking going on. And so that's why I'm trying to kind of um, frame this with these myths that I would say cooperatives have an answer to or response to. And, and in, in more general terms, that means that um, I would like, through these myths and through these uh, responses I would like to think about alternative imaginatives what housing is actually um, alternatives models of uh, how housing is owned and facilitated a very important part and alternative forms of urban development so really going into what Raul was just saying that housing is I see housing as a integral inherent part of, of urbanization and urban development So let's go through the myths. The first one I would say is about housing agency. Who has agency in housing? And we usually think about these two players, right? It's actually either the state, public housing, or there's there's the or the uh, public housing, or there's the market providing housing. Um, I would say there's the third co uh, category, which is actually the people, which of course are part of the state, but not necessarily part of the administrative body. Um, cooperatives actually show that people can act beyond these two entities and become active in what usually is referred to as third sector, which is not, it's, it's kind of a hybrid. They're private, um, people are private um, actors, but they work in a collective way and make deals or, or cooperate with the, with the state and with the authorities to create housing or to to make housing. It's people-led and self-organized, so people organize themselves to get what they need. 
And here's just a couple of images from all around the world where this actually happens, usually on the grassroots level. Um, and that's usually uh, 10 or 20 or 15 years before actually a cooperative house stands or is being built. So kind of the organizational part is very important. So on, on the left-hand side, you see people going to the streets in Zurich, my, my hometown, in the 70s, because they couldn't afford housing in the middle, very actual um, black Black Lives Matter movement in Philadelphia, um, asking for housing. And on the right-hand side, um, a protest in the streets of Karachi in Pakistan um, from the cooperative workers' movement to ask for affordable housing. Um, the cooperative movement can be usually is referred to the beginning, like the, kind of the formalized to the Rockdale Equitable Pioneer Society. Um, I don't know, does anybody know that? Has everybody heard of them? So um, this were a, is a, was a group of, of English uh, tradesmen who um, didn't have enough uh, power and money to, to buy their goods in order to sell them at an affordable, pr affordable price to their communities and themselves. So they formed um, this kind of first formal cooperative. I mean, ways of cooperatives, like cooperatives in an in informal way, basically exist since humans exist, right? But this kind of more formal um, um, uh, establishment of cooperatives is usually, uh, you know, leads back to the mid-1800s. 18, and what they did up to, a lot, of has a lot of this has changed what they did, but what has been very consistent is that they developed a couple of principles, cooperative principles, that are valid within the cooperative movement until today. And I will talk about this um, in the next chapter. It has also led to a global movement. Um, the ICA is the International Cooperative Alliance. It's the biggest umbrella organization of cooperatives founded in the late 1800s and represents cooperatives all around the world. We might not think about this, but the cooperative movement in some areas is quite a big player, but it doesn't appear like this sometimes. We hear news from other kinds of businesses, um, but um, if, if you look at who is participating or buying from cooperatives, a lot of people are involved. So 12% um, of humanity is part of some kind of cooperative worldwide. Um, the cooperative sector makes 2.2 2 .2 trillion turnover per year. And um, cooperatives provide job and work opportunities for almost 10% of the world's employees. And finally, because that's, that's the reason why we have these um, great colors uh, in, my, in this book here, but also in this, throughout this presentation, um, this rainbow flag is the result of a, of a 1924 um, uh, competition to create a flag for the cooperative movement. And that was the result, um, the rainbow flag representing diversity and unity at the same time. Second myth is forms of property. So going back to the linear kind of uh, um, linear thinking, usually we think about public and private ownership, right? Either you it's, again, it's the state who's owning it, you rent it from there, or you have, you have your own property, you own something through the bank or through inheritance or whatever kind of form. The cooperative response is that there's collective ownership, where the boundaries kind of blur between whether you own and rent and things like that. So um, cooperatives are collectively owned. They also show that it's actually possible. You, there's a lot of kind of push back against this model, especially, um, oops, oh, <laughs> that was the wrong, <laughs> wrong glass. Um, especially lenders and banks, they don't recognize collective entities to lend money. But in places where these lenders are, are doing that, that's actually very, a very valid option. And cooperatives, um, through this, they are collectively owned Another very important part is they democratically governed, and there's one share, one vote. So it's basically uh, uh, an enterprise system where everyone who's a member 
has a say in it, is a democratically organized enterprise. Compared to a shareholder company that, you know, where you could buy like hundreds of shares and you buy in and with much more power, you can decide much more as one person owning something or as an institution. Here in the, in the cooperative system, everyone who's part of it has just one, one vote. Everything has to be decided democratically. This can also be seen all around the world in these cooperatives. So again, on the left-hand side, you see the founding, um, founding meeting of the now, now biggest housing cooperative in Switzerland, the ABZ. Um, what's special about this image is that um, women had the right to vote in this, in this entity. They couldn't vote democratically in Switzerland until the 70s. Um, so uh, kind of a very clear, directly democratic system, inclusive system that, um, uh, you know, ask everybody to participate. In the middle, you see a founding um, um, meeting of the Mujirao movement in Brazil, where they um, have a members meeting. And on the right hand side, you see the founding ceremony of a workers, farmers and housing cooperative in Ethiopia. So all these people that you see on these images are owners partly of their cooperative and can decide on what's going to happen with it. So again, as a repetition, that's kind of the most general way to describe a cooperative. And that's the kind of basic, most important part of it is that it's jointly owned and democratically controlled. Um, through this, it's also kind of an organizational model that is different than, I would say, in kind of private entities or shareholder companies. There are similar structures, you need a board, but everything is driven by the members that you see on the top, right? So the members are flipped or moved to the top. They say, they, they, they decide what's going to happen uh, in, in, in their cooperative. And it's also this ethical model, and this is what I was telling about the, the first cooperative of the Rocktail Pioneers. They developed seven principles that are more or less still in, in play today. If you go to the ICA or if every cooperative that becomes part of the International Alliance, they subscribe to these values. And um, as you can see, it's voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, economic participation, autonomy and independence, education, training, information, cooperation among cooperatives and concern for community. So like the upper, maybe you can say the upper four are kind of more organizational. The upper, lo the lower three are kind of very value-based in terms of what, what the cooperative does for, for their members, communities. So education is very important, for example, training is very important. Um, there's no competition between cooperatives, so there's a lot of kind of mutual beneficial cooperation between cooperatives, right? An important thing is when we talk about the United States is that we have to distinguish. Uh, I came here uh, and I was talking about cooperatives and everybody responded, yeah, I had this like my parents or somebody was a member of a co-op in New York and I sold their unit for 2.5 2, 2 million. So what's, what's like affordable about, about that? And, and then I always have to say that there's, in the rest of the world, normally if we say cooperatives, it's a non-profit version. In the States, if it's about housing, the cooperative, the co-op can be a market-driven thing. It's just kind of joint membership in a housing estate where you have to share certain costs, um, but you can sell it for a, whatever price. The limited equity cooperative, on the other hand, um, secures secures the values and assets within the cooperative, so you can't extract money from it. There's there are cooperatives who allow that, so you can build up equity to a certain degree, but not at market rates, but uh, according to the bylaws that the cooperative is setting in order to make the housing affordable long term. What I call culture of practice, so when we talk about housing, usually we, 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 we say, you know, there's the expert, maybe from the government or we as architects, and then there's the lay person, the person who moves in, who, you know, usually doesn't have a lot to say about, 
you know, their housing situation or where they move in. They just see where they could live and then they find out where they can live actually in this place. Um, from the cooperative perspective, I would I would stress something that is more in the in the area of competency, regardless where you're coming from, regardless of whether you studied, if you have a PhD, or whether you kind of uh, have been a gardener or whatever you, your occupation was, but you have kind of a competence in knowing what housing means for you and what do you, what do you need. Right. So, um, in that sense, cooperatives create this um, diversity of competence because they take these different varieties and backgrounds um, um, seriously. And I would argue that they benefit from them. Another thing is uh, it's, so, it's, it's kind of a pooling of resources, not, just, uh, not necessarily in the monetary sense, that as well, but pooling of knowledge, right? Pooling of different backgrounds to, in order to create something that is much more inclusive. Um, and then there's this weird, um, this funny com combination that in a cooperative you're both consumer and buyer, and you're both owner and seller of the product. In a housing cooperative you own it, but you're renting your apartment from the cooperative that you own. So this is this kind of direct involvement um, where you have to also know what you're doing. Um, there's a lot of um, places where um, cooperatives build up competency of their people inside their cooperative. So I know I was living in a cooperative in Zurich. Um, people in the administrative body, like what you would say the real estate department of a big, big housing uh, developer, um, were all people that, usually, like 60-70% were people that learned it on the go when they were as part of cooperative, as part of the cooperative. So they got a kind of education in managing housing estates through being a cooperative member. And so that's what you can see basically on this side is this, this different aspects of it. So uh, very clearly illustrated on the very left that you pull resources as the little fish to, to you know, be able to counter the big fish. Um, in the middle you see a, a very interesting cooperative uh, in, in Barcelona, La Borda, um, which, which was very, as you can see here, the, the woman in the, in the white shirt, she's, she's the architect. She was working with, with the cooperative, with the future members to design their housing units. And on the right hand side, which is usually much more seen in developing contexts, this, this is the case in Brazil, again the Muchirao, where um, this, this, this worker obviously is very happy that he, he has gained an education as a construction worker while being uh, part of the, of the builders' cooperative. So just to rehash this very quickly on, on different levels, so um, the cooperative includes you in very different activities as a member. Um, of course, there's always degree, a degree of how much you can um, engage, but, but there's um, that in the case that you're part member, part democratic decider in this uh, means that you, that you have a say um, in the board, who's in the board, you can be part of the board. Uh, you decide the articles of incorporation, so what is the purpose of the cooperative, so that's very important. Also, housing cooperatives have, can have different purposes. It can be uh, cooperatives for families, for the elderly, for um, whatever, for students, for example. Um, and the bylaws are very important in that they, they decide what kind of or how you translate these, these, um, these principles or what kind of principles into, into your daily business. And the pooling of resources is, is kind of, in terms of financials, is pretty obvious. You, um, and in, this is particularly um, addressing the, the, the context of the United States. Um, through this non-profit model, you have lower costs, usually up to 25%. Um, you can deduct, deduct, deduct your, um, uh, your expenses from the taxes because you're officially owner of something. Um, you are not um, liable, so it's like a limited liability um, setup. 
And um, the cooperative benefits from economies of scale, right? Because all of them together could not afford what they're basically living in as a collective, right? So through the cooperatives, they gain access to, to resources, to capital that they wouldn't be able to as, as individuals. And then the knowledge transfer is usually very, very open. I know like every cooperative I contacted, they give basically free education in cooperative practice. That's their mission, right? They, it's not kind of something that they have to make money from. But um, if you go through the cooperative world, there's all kind of um, like in this case, kind of stuff you can find online or, or they distribute, but also if you go to the cooperatives themselves, they usually have like a whole program of cooperative education. Categories of progress is where I try to kind of distinguish between what we usually uh, understand under on the progress or this kind of thing between having to stay at some place, not innovating and innovation. But in this case, innovation for the sake of innovation, right? So I would argue the, the, no, the kind of open market, the free market usually generates innovation just as a perpetual kind of thing because they have to, not really because they need to at some point or because they create certain needs um, because they want to sell something. Um, in the cooperative world, I would I would say that it's maybe not innovation in that sense, but I'm looking for a different um, expression, which you know it could be maybe you come up with with a better name, but what I call creativity, which um, for me maybe as an architect I'm biased, but usually comes out of solving an issue, a problem, and addressing it uh, to 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 kind of serve a certain need, right? Um, so it's not kind of an ec economic creativity in order to, to create more profit or income, but it's a creativity to create new possibilities. So like I said, it's needs driven. Um, and this creativity in the case of cooperatives uh, shows up in, in all kinds of different ways. Um, of course, I'm going to talk mostly about housing, but there's also other stuff um, that cooperatives have developed that I would say a normal, uh, different setup, economic setup wouldn't have done that way. And sustainable um, is one important issue that, that's also part of, of their ethical code. Like a, lo a lot of cooperatives have this built into their bylaws that they work sustainably, both socially, but also environmentally, if they can. And just as a one, one um, example here, um, this is um, from the cooperative uh, Kalkbreite in Zurich, where you can see that they were looking for different kind of uh, units on the left-hand side. So this, these are the, diff this is the variety of units that you find in this house um, that you would normally wouldn't find in a, in a kind of normal spec uh, development-driven project. Uh, it creates in the middle, you see an image of uh, communal spaces within the houses uh, where um, the whole cooperative can be, everybody who lives there can use them. And on the right-hand side, a very ambitious ag agenda for sustainable practices. So this house was one of the most sustainable buildings in the city of Zurich when it was built in terms of uh, energy use. So that was built, the members wanted to have this, they wanted to use less, less uh, energy, but stay affordable at the same time. And this has led to uh, all kinds of innovation on the architectural scale. There's a couple of cooperatives uh, in Zurich, but also around Europe, who started to kind of question the status quo of what is considered to be a normative housing unit. Um, responding basically also changing demographics, right? So there's uh, European countries have moved towards a lot of single um, households or patchwork families, like the kind of the nuclear family is not the dominant um, um, model anymore. Uh, but the units that are built are usually built either for this or for the high income person, two person household. And everything in between is not covered. 
So in this case, it's uh, what they call loft housing. Um, so the the building comes on, comes in a raw um, industrial setup, and and there's a group of residents who then have to figure out how they organize themselves on this layout. Um, cluster units are very popular, or something that was developed really through these cooperatives in Zurich, where you have like very minimal individual living pots, but then generous shared spaces, kitchen, living rooms, um, etc., where um, different kinds of people, patchwork families or individuals or elderly single people can live together in a community if they want to. The same on the right hand side, that's the student housing with a communal space as you see the course and communal space all around the, the course and the bedrooms. And this is yet from another cooperative, again, showing kind of a variety of, of housing layouts that um, even us as architects have to look at it like a couple of times to understand it in the first place because we're used to other like more, more conventional layouts. Then um, not necessarily directly cooperative, but really based within the whole movement of doing things collectively and affordably. Um, something what I call property innovation or community land trusts. You probably know, you know, who knows what community land trusts are? Good, so that, that's an American invention. But the interesting thing is basically that you, you, you divide property from like the land from the building and you ensure that the land stays affordable in perpetuity. So you can't speculate on the land. And depending on your bylaws of the CLT, you can decide, okay, we want to go full on non-profit, so we, we only allow limited equity housing cooperatives on our land. Uh, but you can also say, okay, um, uh, you can build a single family home and you can sell this house if you want to at a certain price, but the land is non-negotiable. It stays in the community land trust. And as you know, land is usually a big, big chunk of housing costs. So that kind of ensures um, this, this um, again, um, affordability and perpetuity. This is just a distribution of land trusts in the United States. And then another one that I find very interesting is the Miethäuser Syndikat in German out of Germany. Um, I translated myself at a tenement syndicate. Has anybody heard of that one? Um, that is also um, kind of a, another way to split property, but if you could say the, the CLT is split horizontally, um, the syndicate splits uh, properties vertically. So every so you can join the syndicate and as a, as a, let's say you, you live in a multifamily house with, with other uh, of your, with other uh, members, or you're owner of a multifamily house, you can, you can incorporate this house into the syndicate, and then the, the, the title deeds of the building are split into two companies. One that is owned by the people who live in it, 50%, and the other 50% goes into a trust the syndicate. And that, again, guarantees that you can't sell off the property. It stays in perpetuity in this trust, and the trust raises money through the lowered, um, through a kind of a dividend that, uh, through lower costs, renting costs, builds up a revolving fund to finance other people, other houses who want to join uh, the syndicate. And it's just, it's, it's LLCs, but that's in the case of Germany, they found out that's kind of at the moment the most reliable. I think if it would be a cooperative, they, if cooperative would be the, the perfect model for them, they would do that. Um, legally for them, that was the most um, sound solution. And what's interesting about this, similar to the CLTs, it's something that can spread all around the, the country. Right? Other, like usually a housing cooperative is very local. It's just one or a couple of buildings within a city or so, close to a community, but this, these are systems that can spread all around a country, which I think is um, in, interesting. Also because of, again, pooling resources, you have a much broader uh, kind of reach. How 
housing as a sector is what I mean. Again, similar to the public-private, that we have these administrative and industrial sectors who, who work like in their own tracks, right? So we have the administrative part who's developing policies and is, is involved in politics and creates stuff and it's, uh, like yeah, policies and tools, um, sometimes without looking very much across their, their boundaries. The same, the other thing is driven by the industrial um, part where you start, you know, the construction, co um, um, construction sector has a lot of power in de deciding, um, you know, what kind of housing is built, what kind of quality, what kind of materials, etc. Um, here, I would say the cooperative model provides a uh, much more, again, uh, fluent version of that, transdisciplinary. Um, I usually, I don't know, I always have to discern this. So interdisciplinary, from my point of view, is in between disciplines. Uh, transdisciplinary is in between sectors, right? So you, transdisciplinary setups include academia, administrative parts, uh, uh, um, private agents and also, uh, of course, citizens and people, right? So it's kind of a bring things together on from all different um, levels. And this, uh, in the cooperative world, this um, creates these kind of complementary, what I call ecosystems of different cooperatives that serve different needs and complement each other. Again, they are not they are not in competition. So, like the because they're not they work differently, right? They serve a certain certain uh, need. So, a, a, a cooperative that does like uh, food doesn't necessarily needs to get into the housing business because they have to grow in the housing business. That they are concerned with providing food, but they need a housing development next by in order to get rid of their food and buy and sell their food, right? So again, there's these hybrid systems and, and system of mutual benefit. Um, where you can also again see this. There's there's always usually um, um, close closely related cooperatives that work with each other. So on the left hand side, you see. The, I, I'm not sure whether I I, I say that correctly. Credarshan uh, Co-op store in Minneapolis from the 40s, 40s, as part of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement, interestingly, uh, was very involved in, in cooperative practice. So there's a couple of housing um, projects from this time where the African American community provided housing for themselves as, as, as good as they could. Um, and of course, because where they were able to uh, you know, get land to build this, it was usually in places where you didn't have any other infrastructure. So naturally, um, they built up whole systems of cooperatives providing food, or in this case, um, a supermarket. In the middle, you see um, housing development in Ethiopia. Um, this is an ownership uh, model, so a social housing program, the largest in the, Ethiopia's history, based on individual ownership. So they didn't opt for the cooperative ownership model. But what is interesting is that now, through the years, since people moved in there, nobody was taking care about the services, like trash, security, etc. So they they started the the, the owners the the occupants of these housing um, estates started their own service cooperatives, uh, providing for uh, trash collection and security issues, etc. So there's kind of a mutual beneficial relationship between this um, these two entities. And then on the right hand side, uh, example from Switzerland, um, that's the mobility car sharing co-op which was, going back to the innovation part, was the first car sharing company in the world, was a cooperative. Um, because, I don't know, maybe the big players weren't interested, they want, they want to sell cars, they don't want to share them, <laughs> it doesn't make sense for them economically. But from a other perspective, if you live in a city where you don't need a car so often, you, wanna, you don't want to buy necessarily one, you want to share it or just use it and have different options than you know, going through the, the, the usual suspects of, of car lenders and, and car um, operators. 
So this is again, you become part of this. If you become a member, you become a member, you get a better price if you're a member. Um, and the, the kind of um, transit mutual beneficial thing is that they are much more prone to enter um, um, and deals with other entities. So the, the National Railway of Switzerland closely works with them together. So if you have like a, a ticket for the National Railway, you can add the mobility thing to it. So you kind of gain a different kind of uh, mobility pass that is, that is um, usually not available um, on the free market. So just to, to stress this again, there's this, this cooperative network of things that are important in the cooperative world. It's not kind of one big company, maybe a little bit, I will show you later, that accumulates, accumulates, and provides, provides hundreds of different services, but it's usually this cooperative stay in their kind of place where they are, in, where, they're, um, where they have competence, and they um, benefit from each other by providing these different uh, services, uh, especially credit unions are very important in the States, but everywhere that you have kind of lenders that are uh, beneficial for the cooperative model. As soon you have this, usually the cooperative sector thrives um, much, much better. And there's examples all around the world. So this one is uh, Emilia Romana in Italy. You know where that is? That's where all the Tasty food comes from Parma ham and uh, Parmesan and aceto balsamico, all this stuff. Um, and they have a history in, they were, I don't know, in, this, in these times, in the 20s, the cooperative movement was very much linked to uh, the workers' movement and also the left kind of movement, in this case against fascism in Italy. Um, so this area was, was very well organized uh, with the workers. And there's a big tradition in cooperative practice and, and it's very fascinating. I was on a trip, so these are images I took myself from these different cooperatives we visited. Um, from the small, like the sheep, this is a small two-person, five-person cooperative who, who produces, I don't know, 20 sheep cheese per, per week to the large on the right hand, right bottom side where you see the, the big uh, Parmesan cheese to the big uh, Parmesan cheese producers. Uh, they're all cooperatively organized and kind of support each other through, you know, um, giving loans to each other, etc. And it's a very ingrained in the society. I've never seen this, not even in, in, it wasn't the case in Switzerland, but there it's like part of the lifestyle. Interestingly enough is also that this part of Italy is very, it's not so much um, taken over by the mafia, because the mafia usually invests in very cheap real estate development, and the cooperative sector kind of creates different housing that is not very attractive for uh, washing your money or laundering your money. And it's, it goes really, and the biggest exporter of wine, for example, Italian exporter of wine, is a cooperative uh, place in this area. This is again the Swiss system, a Swiss version of it, um, where you have nationwide cooperatives. Uh, Coop and Migro are the biggest um, supermarket chains uh, in Switzerland, but they are also, in terms of turnover, turnover one of the biggest ones in Europe. Um, you have um, Pux. Pux is an insurer. Mobiliar is an insurance company. I was part of the Mobiliar in Switzerland. Which means, um, if they don't, if they fulfill all their obligations throughout the year in claims, and there's money left over, your fee is reduced, as part of being part of the cooperative. So it, the, the, the profit doesn't go to the CEO; it goes back to its members. Mobility again, and then there's even the national little um, um, newspaper Watts in the middle, which is cooperatively organised. And then um, there's this very famous um, example, um, the Mondragon Cooperative in the Basque area of Spain, which is, I would say, consolidated as one big, it's not one cooperative, there's an umbrella cooperative, but there's hundreds of different cooperatives that are affiliated with it. 
And again, there's a whole system that supports each other with uh, financing, um, insurances, and they, they have even a university. And they're, I think, the fifth largest company in Spain. And finally, um, housing as a resource, where um, uh, this is particularly the case, of course, in uh, places like here, where housing is seen as through financial terms, right? It's either your housing situation is a loss or it's an asset, right? Usually if you rent, I, I get this feeling here, you, you throw out the money out of your window because you have no securities, you don't know what's going to happen, you can get thrown out at any time. So there's no security on the renter's market, and so that's seen kind of as a waste of money. Um, and on the other hand, you have the asset, right? Where I still think, you know, as long as you owe money to the bank, you don't really own it yet. It can also be very difficult, right? If, if uh, as we have seen in 2008, it was basically a crisis of this officially having an asset, but not being able to pay for it as, so as soon as rates are going up. And here I draw from, uh, you know, a lot of literature that tries to go back to what housing actually is, is, is a home, right? It's something else than just money, or should be. Or if it's not, maybe we can create a system where the dependence of the house or the living situation is not solely a monetary thing anymore. And here the cooperatives, of course, create a, a totally different sector where you, you're not you're not exposed to speculation. Um, you have long-term tenancy because you're part of it, right? So the cooperative has to vote you out. And before this happens, every cooperative usually has like a solidarity funds, revolving funds. In my case, I paid 10 bucks a month for, from, my, from each rent, went into a solidarity fund, which is then used for people who are in need, who, are, who lose their jobs for a couple of months. Um, to help them financially, etc. So there's kind of a whole structure around it that helps. And um, what I call shared surpl surplus is that, oops, again, so it's the wrong glass. It's not that these cooperatives don't make profits, right? I mean, a consumer cooperative makes profits. The question is what happens with the profits, right? It's not extracted. So whatever you can gain through kind of a delta of, of extra money is reinvested into the cooperative, be it through money or be it through other means. In the housing case, usually, um, it's what I call the shared surplus, is this kind of um, things that you can generate in your house that you usually couldn't because this profit margin is used for this, is first of all to reduce your, your rent, but then there's always something left over or like a decision that maybe a, a private developer wouldn't do. So in this case, you see um, that's the Spree Feld Cooperative in Berlin. Um, have you been there? No? <laughs> it wasn't built, maybe it wasn't built then, 2014? Yeah. yeah. All right, so and I, I just highlighted some aspects of what I would say is a shared surplus. In On the left-hand side, you see the way that's a house, that's a shared um, kitchen, which is not built, finished in the finishing that you would expect from a high-end uh, like housing development. So the members decided, we don't care, we, we can have it raw, if it saves money for other things, we can build up, we can, we can customize our stuff over time if we have money. Um, the second image shows one very important thing that a lot of cooperatives have is outdoor space, communal space. If it's not possible, outdoors, inside. And then on the right-hand side, things like um, additional programs. This is a workshop that the cooperative runs and buys machines. So every cooperative member can go there and you can build your furniture or whatever. You don't have to buy stuff. Or you can build your own stuff or... or, or um, uh, repair your, your things, right? And so for, for the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on this, on this home, on this housing cooperatives, mainly out of Zurich, that maybe show this kind of diversity of things um, that these, these cooperatives have been able to accomplish. Um, it's important to note that there's no national housing program in Zurich, in Switzerland. Um, 
it's a very similar system to here in terms that it's federal, federal um, system, right? So the federal government has, has some uh, responsibilities, but things like taxes, education, local expenses are, are done on, at different at the state level and the community level. So and the supports are usually not necessarily in cash. They're usually uh, through subsidies, revolving funds. They're, of course, they're cash, but not. It's not. It's not an expense that doesn't show up in your ledger anymore as a as a as a as a country or as an administrative body. Um, and preferential loans at very low or zero interests. The city of Zurich, um, interestingly, even though it's one of it's one of the most expensive cities in Europe to to live, besides uh, maybe London, um, has pledged through the push of the people. So we go actually back to the very first slides of people on the street uh, through a democratic um, uh, petition that they have to provide 33% of its housing stock as non-profit by 2040. So, um, and the cooperatives, as you can see, build at the moment, as, as of 2016, are about 18 to 19%. There is, um, you know, the, the public sector who still builds a couple of houses, and then you have um, um, other non-profit actors, but the cooperatives are a big part of that. And this means basically the city has to do this. So every piece of land that is in the hands of the government, <laughs> if you make the math, if you do the math, it has to go into affordable housing, basically. The, the little pieces they still own, they have to go into that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm running through this quickly, yeah. So here you see um, a map of Zurich where all the green areas are cooperatives. The red one is uh, public housing and the pink are trusts. Um, most of these, a lot of these areas were assigned to cooperatives in the 20s and 30s during the labor movement. And they have become part of the city now. They were outside of the city. Um, so what the new cooperatives basically are doing that I show now are they have to deal, they, they don't have access to these big pieces of land anymore, so they have to deal with whatever they have or kind of densify within certain uh, places they already have. And I would just go through a couple of them. The Genossenschaft Dreieck is an interesting thing where they, um, again, you see activities, activities on the streets. They want to do tear down a whole part of the city, this, this triangle. Um, and there was a, a citizen's opposed to that, they uh, were able to, to make the city uh, sell the land to them. And what they did is they wanted to conserve the existing, so it's in situ, like, you know, de deal with the, with the existing, but they also added new stuff in between, and it has become a very, very nice uh, little oasis. Uh, with all kinds of, that's also very important, usually um, little commercial spaces, affordable spaces, you see like places and businesses that you wouldn't see in, you know, at Fifth Avenue, like uh, Bahnhofstrasse, which is the Fifth Avenue of, 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 of Zurich. Wogeno is, has a different model, very interesting, maybe similar to the syndicate that I showed. They are looking for buildings that, that want to join the cooperative. Um, so there's a big, funny portfolio of buildings, as you can see there. A part of that, but if if, a, if if you own a building, you can sell it to the cooperative. The people can stay in the house, and each of the house is independently. Each of the houses are independently managed, so they use again the Wogeno is kind of an umbrella um, thing. Then we see the Kalkbreite that I just showed beforehand. Um, that is building on top of a, a cable car um, garage. That was a piece of land that no private developer wanted to take or do because the profit margins were too low because they had to build up on top of it. And so the cooperative said, we don't mind that. Um, and they created a, a, a cluster and a, a collection of units that were very diverse and is kind of built, built on the people they want to have in the cooperative represent the demographics of Zurich. So it's kind of an inclusive thing. It's not just um, very low-income people, but all kinds of people, which 
is also one important aspect of cooperatives usually. They don't create kind of singular um, users within, within their um, developments, which creates diversity and all kinds of different benefits. That's the image I, I think that advertised my talk. Now, I took it myself. Again, it's kind of public. You can go up. So they did a little park on top of the, the, the garage. And that's the entry lobby, so very luxurious em entry lobby for uh, affordable housing, but that's where they put the resources in. They have minimal units, but they decided we want to have a library and common spaces on the ground floor. Then this is an ex uh, interesting example, Meras Wohnen. It's called More Than Living. That's the translation, which is a collaboration of 55 different housing cooperatives in Zurich. They came together to build a new cooperative. Uh, again, on a piece of land that no um, private developer wanted to take over because it was um, poly um, polluted. It would have taken a lot of money for them out of their profits to, to uh, do that. So the cooperative said, we have a model, we, we go in and we do a new piece of the city. So this becomes a whole kind of little neighborhood. They also have a very interesting way to go about it. The, the, the urban design plan was done collaboratively. They they they. They asked for um, entries, and they chose three, three offices, and they had to work together to come up with the scheme. So it's not just winner takes it all, but kind of a more a participatory uh, version of urban, urban design and planning. Again, very important, all kinds of uh, businesses on the ground floors and common spaces. Uh, a big variety of housing units. Um, there's housing for the elderly, housing for students, housing for for uh, um, families. There's a, a little hotel, which you can see in the back with the greenery, and a little square where they have their weekly happenings, financed by the cooperative, by part of your your um, rent. Ah, oh, that's, that's it. And lastly, this is um, not being built yet, but it also shows the kind of ambition. Like I said, there's a piece of land that own, is owned by the city, so they have to go with affordable housing. And it's, a, again, a collaborative effort between two cooperatives and a more socially oriented commercial real, real estate developer. Um, um, you, you can see the in the middle um, in the middle of the image this this area which was occupied by squatters for a long time. It was a big discussion. The squatters were they tried to include the squatters in developing what's going to happen on that site. So they, side, they decided that some parts will remain. The middle, the shed, like the the, the pitched roof thing in the middle is considered um, heritage. So this is going to stay and will provide all kind of community programs. And you see the two different um, uh, housing cooperatives, one and three, and then the commercial building at two. They all provide all kinds of different um, spaces that are affordable. And it's, I think it's the first cooperative housing tower in Switzerland on, uh, that you see on the right-hand side, where they also, again, the architects, they, they have the, the mandate to come up with some kind of relationship that you can get in this housing when you live on the 17th floor. So they all have kind of communal clusters spread all around the building. Um, so to finish, what I would say, or, would, or what I have started to think about what co urbanism could be is all these things that I, I mentioned throughout the talk. So um, it's a people-centered approach. It's collective and democratic. Um, it, it should take in the knowledge and competence of everybody. Um, it should you know, su supply things that are needed, actually, and not created as a need. Um, transdisciplinary, also, again, in terms of um, being comprehensive. And um, you know, cooperatives basically show that it's not a utopian thinking thought of doing this, they are actually able to, to provide quite decent, high-quality housing at an affordable level. So that's it. Thanks.
questions, questions, of course. You know, I'm just going to kick it off before I just open it up. I'm sure there are many other questions. You know, I, uh, I, I mean, I think, I mean, this is, first of all, a wonderful presentation. And I, the clarity, so thank you, the clarity with which you sort of took us through all of this. And, you know, the myths, uh, a wonderful way to structure and enter it. And each one of those were beautifully triangulated. You know, I was saying market, state, and you had people. And then you triangulated public, private with collective, and experts and layperson with competency, and so on and so forth. I, I don't want to go through them all. The, the thought that was going through my mind, and just uh, maybe this is just a comment, but it would be lovely to get your reflections, is the question of agency. Because when, uh, let's say for us as architects, people who are in this room, designers, planners, landscape architects, because when you show us then the examples at the end, the architect seems to come in very late. Uh, and I, I wonder uh, if, if one develops these ideas and there's a cultural acceptance, then what would agency for the architect mm. mean here? It could be an interesting question. I just want to add another question to it, and just for your reflections. And I was also thinking, Christopher Alexander, Pattern Language, Habrakan supports mm -hmm. an infill, and you yeah. showed a project. It's coming said, back. Yeah. It's coming back. So, I mean, I think in, in, in history, there are moments where expertise align with a culture that has already developed, which is mm -hmm. broader, which is what you were trying to compel us to, or you were trying to encourage us to think culturally like this, let's cooperate the way you ended it. And sometimes design thinking and agency and architectural imagination is not in sync. So in some ways you could say Habrakan and Christopher Alexander, in the way they set out the tools for people to create cooperatives way ahead of its time, and yeah. the culture in exists. Now it exists, and we are not as architects thinking like that, yeah. right? And so it's again linked to the question of agency. Yeah. Just wanted your reflections on that. All right, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's a good question, um, especially if um, as architects, we are um, kind of confronted with this, as you say, you know, we come into a certain project at, at some stage of the project. We don't, and usually we have to just react, right? We can't proactively um, do things. Um, to this, I would say, it, again, it's maybe it's, unfortunately, it's a more kind of a structural um, question because in the, in the case of these cooperatives that I showed from Switzerland, the architects were usually, first of all, for some reason, um, there's always a lot of, there's a lot of architects in the cooperatives because, I don't know, they don't, they're yeah. supposed to be middle class, they can't afford housing, so they you become part of You seem to imply that, that the diversity existed within. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, first, and then I think, um, then there's the competition system, right, where um, cooperatives through that, because they need like new um, ideas in this case, they they tend to do open competitions and sometimes even just idea competitions, not like, oh, we want to have this and this square feet. We want to have your idea, your attitude towards the project. Mm -hmm. And through this, kind of the architectural company or offices come in at a very early stage mm -hmm. where then they develop um, the program with, with the cooperative. And then, yeah, it's, it's also, and then there's kind of a activism part of it, you know, if you're an architect and you want to go in that, yeah. you have to do it. You, you just become part of that movement. Um, I was, the, the Kalkbreite, the thing, is, oops, the thing that is built on top of the garage, the, the, the cable car garage, um, that you can, you, <laughs> you can have tours. Mm -hmm. And I called the cooperative and said, you know, um, I have a couple of uh, architecture students, they want to see it. You offer tours, I see. Um, yeah, and they said, yeah, I'm calling, the, I'm calling the architect. And the architect himself walked us through the building and was obviously very, very proud of it mm -hmm. and ha had like a real kind of skin in the game, you see. And he also said that this kind of <coughs> process changed the way he thinks about architecture as well. And, so the, and the second one, um, yeah, that, that's why I think at the same time, we, we always have to work in these uh, you know, uh, spheres of the actual and practitioners, but also think about what could be and what, how should it be and how could it be, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of these cooperatives that I showed have a th 
their origin in kind of some some kind of utopian idea mm -hmm. of how we live together, mm -hmm. and and you could say you know the hop rocking at the time was was utopian, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's still important to do it. Mm -hmm. You never know what happens. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we still talk about it, and right. now in some cases it can be become it can become a reality, right? Mm -hmm. But it's it's always this. Um, we shouldn't inhibit ourselves as architects to think beyond kind of pragmatic stuff, right. I would say. Well, they say theory is reflecting about what's happening on the ground, so maybe yeah. it's time to theorize yeah. what we see in these cooperatives. You had a question. If you can briefly introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Ellen Greenberg. I'm Hi. a retired planner. I'm a Berkeley grad. Um, oh. And I had a chance to um, be in Zurich recently and have a chance to actually see that project oh. you're talking about. I wonder if you could comment on the institutional arrangements with the co-op organizations that are involved in multiple projects and kind of whether there's a professionalization of the management and development side or to what extent the residents are involved in the development of new buildings when you get into what appears to be kind of a larger organization mm -hmm. with multiple properties. Okay. So were you involved in cooperatives in Berkeley? In the, I'm sorry? Were you involved in any cooperative activity at Berkeley? Because Berkeley was is, is in the States. That's kind of a little uh, point of origin <laughs> of, cooperative, of the cooperative movement. Yeah, yeah? Uh, I've not been directly involved. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, there is a certain, I would say, professionalization, of course, because you know these are big operations. Some of them are large owners of property, right? So in the case of the one that I showed, More Than Living, where they had 55 cooperatives coming together, it was they formed the More Than Living cooperative first and elected their representatives. And some of the board was filled with members of the other cooperatives as well. And that's how they, I think, um, you know, ensured like that, first of all, communication is always ensured, but also that Every the very diverse set of cooperatives. There were the big ones with a lot of money, a lot of assets, and small ones that were maybe more important in terms of intellectual things. Um, so it's professional, um, but still based on on a very kind of basic democratic uh, setup. And in this case, also um, a very strong connection directly to the city. So they in. I think there's even a city council member part of the board, um, and um, with with um, future uh, businesses. So they started a, a really early on process to to seek out businesses that could be part of it, and they gave input, very important input to how it should be structured, because the housing cooperatives didn't do that at that scale before that. Hi, my name is Alec. I'm a planner. Uh, most of my academic and professional career has been in cooperatives. Oh. And the two obstacles we always find in the United States is uh, zoning and finance. So California just passed a state bill called AB 816, mm -hmm. which allows for retail investors to invest up to $1,000 in cooperative projects. Um, and that has been helpful in the garnering of finance. But here in Boston, we just broke ground on a food co-op that took 12 years to get to just 70% of the total equity needed to open yeah. it. And so we're still in the process of, of fundraising for it. So I'm curious if you've seen any financial models that have been as effective as, you know, one could argue private sector models. Um, a lot of banks are still kind of hesitant yeah. to lend to cooperatives. So that's question one. And then two is in the United States, zoning is, tends to be so prohibitive for people, you know, a certain number of non-related people living with each other makes cooperatives really difficult to yeah. build because of building codes. Yeah. So those two questions I'm wondering. All about. right. Um, those are good and challenging questions. Um, does, I mean, I'm, I'm just entering my into the American kind of scale and market and framework. So... Um, like I, I think I mentioned it, I mean, the biggest issue with um, money is that you, first of all, you don't have uh, big, big lenders, right, that would uh, lend money to a collective. 
Um, and so um, I just had a talk, uh, invited um, a colleague of mine who's involved in a community land trust in LA, who said that for a housing project they developed, they had to, they had like 35 different sources of money, which is not very competitive if you compare it to a developer who has just cash, right? Or a direct credit line to, to his or her house bank. So that's an issue, I think. But on the other hand, you have a lot of mutual banks here, which are basically, you know, defined as cooperative banks, right? So, so maybe before you found a housing cooperative, you have to found a mutual bank, right? Um, and then there's other ways in Switzerland, in Zurich, for example, there's other things where, where um, I think they're very smart in ways that you, you don't have to raise so much money. For example, in Zurich, if you are an officially established cooperative um, and you're looking for money for a mortgage, um, first of all, you can, you, know, you, can go, you can go back to all kinds of institutional lenders there are cheaper, bigger chunks, the revolving fund, but um, the city stands in as a backup, as a as a as a guarantee. So you don't you you only have to uh, make a down payment of eight percent, right? So you don't need twenty percent, which makes a big difference in terms of cash you have to put in your hands, and and the city guarantees to the lenders, and that's I mean there's basically no cooperative that that ever kind of failed. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. First of all, the need is there, but also they're usually very, very, um, well, they might be progressive in their attitudes, but they're very conservatively run in terms of money, right? They're, they, because it, it depend, they depend literally on themselves to make it financially feasible. And yeah, the planning, again, I think it's, that's a big issue, right? It is, I don't know how you, this, can change this through advocacy you now, or certain need, I think, at the moment would be the perfect timing to do that. I mean, I heard, for example, um, at ours, we have um, uh, Larry Scarpa from Brooks and Scarpa at our faculty, and he just, he, he, he talked about what, what they were doing, and they had their office doing affordable housing, and then at the same time, advocacy groups, and they were involved, it also took 10 years, but in the end, they were involved in, in the law that allowed to subdivide plots, for example, and build more denser um, setups. So, you know, that's, that's, you probably have, it's great that you are active, so 12 years, <laughs> probably another 12 years for a housing co-op. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I think that's again what I meant by agency, because yeah. in those triangles you showed, there are many spaces which become like bridge spaces, yeah, right? Yeah, right? You have to. Rather than being one point of the triangle. Yeah, yeah you have to be very um, persistent. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm Matt Coogan. I'm a, I graduated in 2019 from uh, the urban planning program here and a joint program in law at Harvard Law School. Um, and now I'm a real estate um, development and land use lawyer in Boston. Um, and I just have two sort of concrete questions about the governance of co-ops. I'm not because I'm not familiar with them. Um, if there's a vacant unit, uh, are, is the voting power of that unit sort of just set aside until it's occupied, or is it is it exercised by the um, the cooperative itself? Um, that's the first question. And secondly, I correct me if I'm describing this wrong, but it seems that. Um, Voting power sort of vests over time as you um, live there longer and pay more into it. You don't buy a whole interest in a whole unit. Um, you can rent it from the co-op and eventually gather more voting power as you live there. If, if that's, maybe that's, that's wrong, I don't know, let me know. <laughs> um, but if that's the case, is there a tension to manage with people who have lived there a long time and have more voting power than the first, you know, the renter who just moved in. Conversely, if that's not the case, if everybody has one vote, just, you know, despite how long you've lived there, is there a tension to manage with the longer term tenant who may feel entitled to, to more power because 
if she's lived there longer. Um, thanks. So, first of all, that's exactly what we need: lawyers and real estate developers getting on the on the train. So, I'm happy to see you here. <laughs> Maybe there's something that you can, you know, transmit outside of this room. Um, to your second question, there's always just one vote. One, regardless how long you've been there, how much you pay. There's differences in the share, the amount of share you have to buy. Usually new cooperatives, they ask for bigger shares because they just are building up. Um, um, older cooperatives from the 20s, 30s, I was the one I was living in was founded in 20, 1927. So they, there you just pay a share that is equivalent to square footage you rent. So in that case, it was $6,000. Dollars, another one, a new one. I know you had to pay twenty-five thousand, and in that case, usually because they target also people who may not have twenty-five thousand on their on the bank, um, you can pay it down on a on a on a monthly basis without any interest. Uh, but the vote you get immediately, and that means, um, I mean, there's tension. I I saw that in in my cooperative, you know. You see, like, in, in my case, it was an expansion of the cooperative. The cooperative whoops, took down old buildings and then put new ones, more densified, much more units. So the cooperative was expanded by members, right? So they had, like, 100 units left or that they put on a lottery online. And there you kind of saw some tension in, you know, like the old people who know how it works and know what it is, but that's that's how it is, you know, that's what you buy in, you know. Uh, on the flip side, these people were living in very, very affordable conditions for the last 20 years, so it's like, it's like a payoff. You know? And the first question was... Uh, vacant units? Vacant units, um, they, they go away so quickly. There's a waiting list, hundreds of people waiting. And that, actually, that's one of the big, biggest issues, I would say. My criticism on the, model, on the cooperative model is that it's a member model. So the, the more you propagate it, the more they are, the better, right? Because then everybody could have access. But if it's just like a, a small group of cooperatives where everybody wants to get in, um, it's, a, it's an issue. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Jose Carlos. I'm a, a PhD student here at the university. Uh, I'm a lawyer, actually, now that you mentioned that. Uh, I think people more in the social sciences will be useful in this kind of stuff. I'm studying, uh, basically, um, in Latin America, this same style of uh, how, ha uh, owning housing. Uh, and what I'm saying is that even though the formal laws are actually very individualistic, in the informal practices, if you actually study them, you actually find very much uh, cooperative models. Uh, so it's nice that you presented that how much this seems to be very common in many other places in the world. I wanted to know how much was Zurich an outlier within Switzerland or Switzerland uh, an outlier in the world. Uh, sometimes when we put the maps, we put lots of dots yeah. and but that's not that representative because that's maybe one case in one city and that's yeah. actually very small. But that's, it, it would be nice to know that many people are doing this around the world, yeah. Okay. Well, Switzerland is always an outlier, regardless, because it's, it's a weird, weird place. <laughs> little, little, very rich country for different reasons. So, but then on the other hand, it's funny that Zurich has this, had, I mean, it was very much dependent on a strong worker movement. So usually see that in other countries where they had a strong worker movement in the 20s and 30s, you also have cooperatives. Um, um, Zurich is a little outlier in Switzerland as well. There's cooperatives all, or, all around Switzerland, but then, as I said, it's a federal system, so there's always the same kind of support on the federal level, but then on the communal level and state level, there's different mechanisms. Um, and Zurich is really probably much more progressive and militant in terms of what kind of cooperatives they do, uh, but it's, which is fine, you know, because in other cities, it, they just use it as a vehicle with not much of kind of, they don't want to be the most progressive cooperative. They just use the, the enterprise system to create affordable housing, which is also good, you know. Um, 
in, where, where in Latin America are you look? Peru. Peru, I'm from Peru. Uh -huh. but I'm, what I'm saying might be applicable in many other countries. I mean, there's different, yeah, Brazil was a little difficult. There was this big uh, Minha Casa, Minha Vida program, big public housing program where they, the billions of dollars put in and they, they secured like, I don't know, 500 million for the cooperative sector. And it wasn't so successful to my understanding because the knowledge wasn't there. So people, there was the money, but nobody could kind of, the cooperative education wasn't there. That's that's a pity to some sorts. But then there's uh, Switzerland of uh, Latin America in terms of cooperative is Uruguay, right? So they have a very strong cooperative housing sector where um, you know they, they were very successful and they they are also very strong in kind of spreading the idea. So they have connections to all kinds of Latin America America countries. So if you I, I would go for Uruguay if you're kind of interested in that. So we're running out of time, but I see many hands up. So I one, two, three, four, very briefly, and we'll collect the questions, and then you can respond to them. And we only wait. But just be as brief as you can, please. Thank you. Hi, hi. How are you doing? Uh, I'm a faculty at the architecture department, Emmett. Um, I, I guess in, in the briefest form, I was wondering if you could identify maybe in in terms of the kind of the question of creativity one uh, key variable in the American context in terms of code and maybe zoning as well that would allow, would unlock maybe the economic and also programmatic flexibility of the co-op. You know, whether it's the two staircases, the questions of, you know, egress, construction methodology, land use, et cetera, where within that regulatory framework is there a real roadblock to some of that creativity? But I think we're going, we're aggregating. The okay, maybe yeah, I'll, the I'll keep it, yeah, I'll try to keep it. I will build off of Emmett. I'm uh, Jenny French, faculty um, in the architecture department. Hi. I've just finished after six years uh, a co-housing um, uh, group, 30 units outside oh, of Boston. That is, you know, condominium financed, collectively owned, yeah. but still prorated. Yeah. Um, that also had to make an ordinance change in a municipality. So maybe building off of Emmett, I think I'm particularly interested in the innovative ways in which households and the construction of households start to hinge this, right? So definition of where both fire separation, egress, um, you know, voting capacity versus the aggregation of non-traditional families yeah. come into play, which well, I think you showed I, examples of. Yeah, maybe I'll let you answer yeah. these yeah. two. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Are <laughs> um, yeah, again, I'm not so familiar. I mean, there's building codes are very different in every state, right? I, I happen to know that LA and California is pretty, pretty tough. Um, I mean, there's surely, I think in the case of, of um, LA or California is, is the, like all kinds of, things that are related to security, fire security, are very restrictive in that sense. I would, so I think you're right in terms of egress and, and things like that. Um, on the other hand, again, I think it's, and that goes maybe to your, leads over to your question, you had to make an ordinance, right? So change of, right? So that's where again, the kind of activism comes in that you, I think, you probably have to work on two, two uh, tracks, right? On one hand, you try to exploit the system and see where are the loopholes, what can I do? And on the other hand, you kind of advocate for a big change. That's what, what we need the lawyers for, basically, right? In, in, in LA, for example, there's this uh, uh, tick thing going on. Have you heard of it? Tenants, tenants in, in common, where they, they found a loophole where they can split the mortgage into four without the bank having to kind of have four lenders. So, and there's a whole kind of little movement growing around that, which doesn't necessarily create affordable housing, but they found a way to kind of circumvent the, the normal codes. Hi, I'm Alberto Kritzler. I'm a low fellow this year from Mexico City. Uh, so it sounds to me like to, to broaden the impact of the cooperatives, you would somehow need to um, convert private, privately owned land into cooperatives. I mean, that sounds difficult, but I'm wondering whether you've seen any models in different countries where, you, where they have transitioned or created incentives or forced that to happen. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's a very important question, and it's. Yeah, a, 
Can you just take this one too? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Hi, uh, so Marcel Maroon. I'm a Hi. master's design studies student and architect. Um, I was interested in how uh, extremely low income uh, families are included in these uh, projects. And you talk a little bit about the uh, incentivization of, of buying into these projects and a certain sort of buy in level that you have to reach. And even though you have monthly payments, you know, there's families that just simply can't afford yeah. any additional funding. Yeah. So, how, how are these families, uh, you know, folded into these cooperative systems? So, I'll go first here, okay, and then to the land question. Um, so, this in, in the case of Switzerland is usually um, that you get a preferred treatment as a cooperative, but you have to um, provide housing, subsidized housing for the very low income people. So a lot of cooperatives provide, so the city, they negotiate and the city says, we need in your, in your development, we need this and this amount of square footage for low income housing units. We subsidize like the rent but you have to rent them to us. And that's a trade-off. So they can do, they can go up with, um, you know, density, but that's the deal. And that's also, I think, uh, you know, in that case, a good, good model because it creates also mix and diversity. So you, you live kind of with all kinds of different people in the same house. Yeah. Um, and the land, yeah, and the land, that's, that's a difficult one because yeah, I just read for the hundredth of time the the, the who is it? The, you have to to buy land. They don't don't do it anymore. From the author, the, the famous American author, who did the quote: "You have to buy land. They don't do it anymore." Um, that that's an issue. Um, there are again. I think there's some some. Again, you have to do, I mean, once the land is sold to some private um, entity, it's very difficult to get it back. Um, sometimes, I think I saw, for example, that we just had an example for, uh, next to our campus at USC. Um, there was a developer who wanted to, um, who, who bought a piece of land, wanted to evict the, the, the tenants and, and um, build like high-end student housing and so the whole neighborhood reacted to that and went to the streets and fundraised money from different places to buy the piece of land and made kind of obvious to the developer that even if he doesn't buy, sell them the land they will keep on going <laughs> um, so kind of a pressure from the streets another thing is uh, again like the what I said with these 33% that Zurich has to provide in affordable housing is that it really, um, they don't have any, any choice anymore. Every single piece of land that they still own has to be used for that. Um, and then again, like these spaces of opportunity, I think regardless of pressure on the, on the, on the housing market and the land market, there's always areas where the land is more, like relatively cheap even if it's somewhere where you don't think uh, we can build housing there, but maybe in 20 years we can. So there's kind of an, I would say, as both as non-profit um, entities or the state, or I think you should you should look look out for these things because the the ones I showed you in Zurich, they were all on pieces of land that nobody was interested in. So it's, it's like seeing the kind of opportunity down the line because that's again a, a private developer thinks in 10, 15 years, right? I don't know. Return has to come in very quickly. Um, as a non-profit, that doesn't matter. You can invest in something if you are able to pay whoops, certain fees or things down the line for 20, 30 years, it doesn't matter. No, thank you very much. No, thanks, you know. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Good. No, I, I, I just want to say that I think just the questions reflect the complexity and the kind yeah. of transdisciplinary nature, as yeah, you described great. it, of the issue. And so thank let's all so really much. cooperate. So thank you very much uh, for this. Thanks, Shasha.